Tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make up my trouble. Quickly and then I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus I cannot bear my burdens alone I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted with. Tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world, the victory to win. Amen. Good evening, brethren, and welcome to our Wednesday evening prayer pulse. We thank you for being here. We look forward to having our wonderful worship session together this evening as we explore the theme, the call to discipleship. Before, as we begin, let us bow for a word of prayer. Almighty Father, we thank you for assembling us in your house of praise. We thank you for the day we've had, for the opportunities that were presented to us, and for the experiences that we gained from what was done in our lives today. As we assemble in this place this evening, we've come to worship, to praise your name, to testify to your goodness and your love and your care. Condescend to be with us this evening in the person of your Holy Spirit. May our experiences be amplified through the presence of your angels as they sing and testify with us. Bless those who are coming. Bring them quickly, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We will begin with the use of hymn 306. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice. And it told thy love to me, but I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer 
draw unto thee. Draw me nearer. Savior, holy thine. Teach me how, teach me how. Number 308. I would do thy will, O Lord, not mine. Help me, help me now. Number 202, Hail Him, the King of Glory, 202. Tell it 
to every king, dread a nation, tell it far and near. Earth's darkest night will fade with the dawning, Jesus will soon appear. Hail him, the King of glory, once the Lamb for sinners slain. story Jesus comes to reign nations again in strife and commotion warnings by the way signs in the heavens on erring omen hair of the glorious day hail him the king of glory once the Lamb for sinners slain, tell, tell the wondrous story, Jesus comes to reign. Children of God, look up with rejoicing, shout and sing His praise. Blessed are they who, waiting and watching, look for the dawning, Hail him, the King of glory, once the Lamb for sinners slain. Tell, tell the wondrous story, Jesus comes to reign. Amen. Well, let me issue the welcome again, now that we are filling up nicely. We thank you guys for being here. I'm Excited to see all of us in the house of the Lord this evening as we come to pray, to worship, and to express our thanks and to make our petitions known unto God. We are going to stand and sing 207. It may be at morn when the day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. Stand with me, please. Christ 
returneth. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Luke, chapter 5. And we are going to look at verses 1 to 11 for our scripture reading. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. <laughs> and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesareth, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would trust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when, they had, when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in another ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that, so they, that they began to sink. When Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, up at Jesus knees, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And, and so it was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all. And followed him. This evening we are going to study for our prayer pulse session the call to discipleship. We are go let us pray. Dear God in heaven, how wonderful it is to be in your presence. We could only imagine what those first apostles felt as they saw your miraculous work firsthand and were eyewitnesses to your teaching. This evening, dear Lord, we have your spoken word. And we have the Holy Spirit. We have your written word, sorry, and we have the Holy Spirit with us. And we've come into this place to hear from you, to commune with you, and to petition your throne. Bless our worship session. We pray for every head bowing in your presence, whether in person or virtual. We pray for all the prayer requests that have been entered into the book written down or what is in the heart of each worshiper. We pray, dear God, that as we tabernacle together this evening and your presence is felt in this place, that the call which you gave to the apostles will resonate with us so that ere we leave this place, we will go with the same fervor that they had when they followed you. Bless us as we worship together and continue to guide us, protect us for Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. It is prayer and testimony evening, and uh, we, would, we would like to incorporate that into our worship, and, but I, I have some specific things I would like to ask for testimonies about, but before we get into that aspect of our worship service, is there anyone who wants to give God thanks publicly for something he has done in your life? Do you wish to testify? Please. There's a microphone in the middle. After. Oh. It's coming. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. First of all, <laughs> um, first of all, I'm just saying thanks that I finally got here. Amen. And um, God has done a lot of good in my life, but I just never had the time to actually say thank you. I've always 
been in the church from a child, but I strayed away. He didn't stray from me, I strayed from him. So I'm glad I'm here, but let me tell you, I'm straight up, I'm very real, and if you bore me, I'm running out of here, straight. But God's word can't bore me, but just make sure that you just put it over in a way that it won't put me to sleep, because every church I go to puts me to sleep. So well, that's why I stopped going to church and pray in my heart, because my heart is my church. Amen. 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 We'll be brief. Brother? Uh, good night to everyone. Good night, sir. I right, thank the Lord for taking me and you had to say that in the church of the house of God. And I want to say that I really achieve a lot from the Father saying, say, yeah, baptize in them, right? Amen. And I want to thank the Lord for what he has done in my life. Amen. Changed me and Amen. caused me to think more voices than before. Amen. And I hope that I will continue to press forward and give praise and thanks to the Most High, Almighty God, Amen. that I will not give up and that I will continue to serve him Amen. and be a man of God Amen. as he wanted to make me. But I want to say this here. Years ago, when I was a kid, I have been, my mom and my dad were not a Christian, but I went to church, me and my sisters and brothers, and I started to worship in the church as a young guy. And then, as the years, I started a backslide. And I thank him. The young lady over there, she, in my neck, right? She asked me, woman over. Maybe um, I, I wanted to come and get church. So I tried to find it. She put it off, put it off, put it off. But one day I decided to say, said, don't no, think no about it, right? And asked myself, God, this is what I really wanted, or this is what I like it, or. And I said, don't let myself, you can't run away all the time. Amen. Because run away is just playing again. So I decided to got baptized and come now to the Father. Amen. And I hope that God will show me the way and I will keep serving him. Amen. Thanks to the Lord and Amen. thanks to everyone and thanks to the young lady over there and everyone in church. Amen. Good night to everyone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It, um, for those of you who are on Zoom and so the opportunity is given to you to be part of this testimony service, and so feel free, there is, once you express your desire, we would accommodate. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone else? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um. Just, just bend the top. You're right. All right. There's a technical guy. Yes. Good night to everybody. Good and night, sir. It's nice to be here. Amen. I've been to several churches, um, being invited by um, co-workers, and sometimes neighbors where I used to live too. But I never was a constant church goer. Okay. But then I moved from the areas and stuff. But I moved to um, Richmond's area where I met Alicia and her family. Okay. And I was living there for a while, but they never really invited me to church at, when I was much younger, but as I grow older, you know, then she, her mother um, invited me to church um, um, in, in 2011, 2012, in that year. Uh -huh. Anyhow, I, I've been there, but since I have not been to church, so... I thank her that she come to me and ask me, mm -hmm. and I accept it, mm -hmm. because in these days, they're, they're very short, and yes. people um, dying from all sorts of illnesses and sicknesses, and true. God is the only way, the truth, and the life, Amen. and you, you should accept 
Christ in your heart because he's the only savior of the world. Amen. So I, Amen. Thank, I thank Alicia for coming to me and I myself taking that opportunity and the choice to come to Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. And I, I know I, I'm not going to regret it. In Amen. Je in Jesus' name. Yes, sir. Thank you. Amen. 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 Is there anyone else who would like to share a word this evening? Well, we, we, we're going well. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. Yes, ma'am. I just, because they would have given their testimony, I felt, you know, moved to do the same. <laughs> I, I'm thankful that, you know, that I, I'm, list, I'm the hearing, you know, God speaking to me and trying my best to obey when he calls and, and leaves. Amen. And I'm thankful for the fact that he answers prayer. Amen. God answers prayer. Amen. Amen. And if there's anybody out there who's not sure because they're not hearing or they feel as though, you know, they're not getting that response that they would like, keep praying because God is faithful. Amen. And I would have, like they mentioned, invited them to the crusade at Melverton. They went. One of them also went to the revival that we had at Advent. Amen. And on Sabbath, um, the person who was here last, as his name is Ernest, he was baptized on Sabbath. Amen. At, um, at Ebenezer. And the week before that, Mr. White was baptized as well. Amen. And they're both going to be members of our King Street Church. Hallelujah. Welcome, Praise gentlemen. Praise God. Welcome. For that. Amen. 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 Well, this, this leads into what I want to discuss this evening, and we are not going to be long or boring. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. So, so I, I want to ask those of us who have been in church um, for quite a while. Um, I, when I was born, my parents were already Seventh-day Adventists. And they tell me I was born one Sabbath after between lunch and AY. So, <laughs> there was nowhere, nowhere else to be but in church now, I guess. Right. But could you imagine the experience that the apostles had on that beach when Jesus comes along preaching and he sits down in their boat and says, push off a little way, let me get the attention of this audience. And so he's in the boat and talking to the people on land and they're hearing him. And these guys are mending nets, washing nets, taking care of their fishing tackle. That's their livelihood. But they hear the preaching of the gospel. And when they're finished, Jesus says, now go out and cast this net. And they caught so much fish that two boats couldn't contain what they had. And having just had such a haul, huh? such a haul that two boats had to land it, Jesus says, now leave that and follow me. All right? So this is your livelihood. This is your business. This is the best catch you ever had. And now that you've made your biggest haul, Jesus says, all right, leave that now. Time to do something else. Come and follow me. All right? Do you remember the time when you first heard Jesus call you to follow him? You remember where you were, what you were doing? What were the circumstances that led to that moment? Does somebody want to share that testimony? Where were you when Jesus called you? I was approaching my 10th birthday. It was a month before my 10th birthday. 1984 in Queens Park in Grenada. After all the upheaval of 1983, the death of Morris Bishop, the execution of his cabinet, the invasion by the United States. Yes, I'm a Grenadian. And Don Crowder came to town and pitched a huge tent and preached in Queen's Park. And I went a few nights. But this it was Sabbath morning. And he preached. I can't remember the sermon. Don't remember the text. Anything about it. But I know when the altar call was made, the Holy Spirit said, that is for you. And I got up and I went. 
I didn't get baptized that day because I wasn't prepared. But at the next opportunity, I was baptized by a lay preacher, Mr. William Chase, in, 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 um, in my church. So that was for me. That, that was me. Where, what were you when God called you? What were you doing? Go ahead. So I'm going to ask this one a, a little bit different because I too was born into the Adventist church. I used to get brain church in the Moses basket. I, I still have the basket home, if you can believe that. But nobody is born a Christian. Amen. And nobody's born an Adventist. And I think sometimes, and it's also, we all like to hear when persons give their life and they come in, it, it makes a difference, guys. And we thank you for continuing to do it. Amen. So all I can do is represent the ones that were always there. And sometimes our testimony gets lost. Yes. Because we were always there. We were always doing the things, going through the motion. And we don't necessarily feel the zeal. We don't necessarily feel the pull and the passion. We hear the others come in and how God made a difference. And they're so excited. And you kind of get lost into, like, where's my testimony? Like, uh -huh. I don't really feel that way. I don't really feel inclined to say, but you're still going through the motions. I got baptized in 1998 by Pastor Joseph in one of his, I call it graduation cruises, second year internship here, right on Passage Road Pasture. And even then, Elder I don't think that I really answered the call, even though I was baptized. All right. I, I, I didn't. I, I want to say that my conversion or start thereof actually came at Advent Fellowship at UE. Okay. For the first time, I got introduced to another culture. You had all the other Caribbean countries coming in. Most of the persons were on scholarship. They had no funding. The scholarship money, Ella Shalry, always came late. <laughs> and, and the president and vice president of Advent Fellowship, I never forget two St. Lucians, Paul and Monica, and I hope I get to see them again. And they showed me a different way. Both of them were on scholarship and had no money. The money always came six months late. When you are there, when we, we were Bajans going up to you, we are going back to the comfort of our homes. But Sabbath meant something different for these people because it really meant a release from all the stresses that was going on. Yes. And Advent Fellowship in my time was small, not like how it is now where it's, it's flourishing. And I dare say it benefited from the work that we did as founders. We had eight people, Sister Alicia. There was one guy that could sing, and it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. That was Ronnie from Antigua, and I hope I meet him again. And every single Friday night of every day of the year at Elder Fullerton, he had to sing special music because nobody else could sing. It, it was that type of affair. There, there was no room for bench warming. There was no room for pretending. Right. The, the lecturers were stressing us out. We used to go in A19, El Elder Shallery, and the lecturers would carry on the class an hour into sunset, and we had to wait. And we waited. And then at one point, they wanted to combine us with the United Christian Fellowship and make us disappear, and we refused. Right. And we continued to press on. It was then that I understood what it meant to commit. Yep. So for me, Avant Fellowship was my charge up every Friday night and admittedly to be drained every Sabbath. <laughs> because the persons that I came to on Sabbath, they couldn't understand my new testimony. Right. They couldn't understand my new passion because it was like, what changed? What was different? So I would say that while I was born here, while I was baptized there, my true call or answering thereof really came in that probably 2002, 2003 period up at university. And I thank God for Advent Fellowship. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. I, 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 could, I could understand you because, uh, yes, I was baptized. I was just about 10 years old. But um, no. when, I, when, I, when I turned 17, mm -hmm. somebody came and asked me to join a gospel band. And it's from that sort of ministry that I got your experience. And it's at that time when, I, when they asked me to speak and I realized I had the gift of gab that I could get up and deliver and talk to an audience and be comfortable in front of people. That, 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 my life changed at that time. My life changed at that time. Amen. So think about what we're going to have our, our first prayer pulse. Think about at least one person you would like to see accept Jesus as their Savior. Think about one person you know who needs to experience this joy that we are having. And let's pray for the Holy Spirit to start a work in that person's life. You think about that now and take 40 seconds, a minute, and pray for that one individual that the Lord lays on your heart at this moment. So that we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit begins a work in their lives.
here in the church and those online. We're going to take a minute now for this. Amen. Why did Jesus call those apostles and say, come follow me? At the end of his ministry, we see him telling them why. It took three and a half years for them to get to that point when Jesus said, this is why, this is what I want you to do now. And so in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, we find what we call the Gospel Commission. And for everyone who comes to church knows that almost every first Sabbath of the month, we get up and preach from Matthew 28, 18 to 20. But do you know that every Gospel writer has the Gospel Commission in, that, in his book? Every Gospel writer has it. Let's have a look at them. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That is Matthew's version of it. Matthew was a former church member when Jesus called him. They called him Levite. Matthew was a Levite. He was a, the Levites were the people from whom from which the priesthood came. So he was a preacher's son, but he had left church and he was at the seat of custom collecting money on behalf of the Roman government, the most hated job in all of Jerusalem, a tax collector. He, he was siding with the opposition. Do you know how tax collectors made, got their salary? If Rome wanted 5%, they charge you 7 2% went in his pocket. And that's why they were hated because that's, that's how they made money. But then Mark, in his gospel, Mark chapter 16, 15 to 18, also lists the gospel commission. Mark 16, 15 to 18. Yeah, all right, without my glasses, I can read it up there. And he said unto them, go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay their hands on the sick. And they shall recover. I don't know if you want to try the serpent thing or drink the poison. But Jesus came and spoke to the apostles and says, Now this is what I want you to do. And if you encounter these scenarios and deal with it, this would be the experience you would have. 
you will drink poison, not meaning that you would attempt suicide. But if you accidentally consume something that you shouldn't, it wouldn't have any effect on you. And if you accidentally come across a rattlesnake in the proclamation of the gospel, it won't bother you. Didn't Paul have that experience? Yeah. Paul was gathering wood for the fire after he was shipwrecked. He picked up the bundle of wood and a viper came out and fastened itself onto his hand. And the, people, the natives knew that within half an hour you'd be dead. So they expected him to swell because he had a neurotoxin. He would swell and die. But he just shook the viper off in the flames. And when they realized, wait, time passed and he was still alive, but everybody thought he was something wonderful. What, how does Luke express it? Luke 24, 44 to 53. We're not going to do all of, of Luke. But Luke, the gospel commission is in Luke 24. And from verses 44 to 53, you would find the gospel commission there. Let's look at verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. They were there hiding, they were discouraged, they were distraught because he was dead. He opened their understanding that they might understand the scripture. He preached all of these things to them. And then he says, go and preach the gospel. Luke 44, Luke 24, 44 to 53 is where in all of that text you would find the gospel commission from, the, from Jesus in Luke's gospel. Who was Luke? Luke was not an uh, apostle. He was a Gentile. The scholars believe that Luke got baptized when Stephen preached. And when he heard so much about Jesus, he became intrigued by it. And he says, no, I want to know more about this. So Luke systematically sat down and interviewed eyewitnesses and wrote a book about what he heard. He was that kind of academic fellow. So he, he wrote, he, he spoke to the eyewitnesses. And he compiled a book, a letter, and, and he says, this, this is what they have told me, and I have no reason to doubt it. And then John chapter 20, verses 20 to 23, tells us the gospel commission in the book of John. John 20, 20 to Okay, and when he had said, he said, he showed them his hands and his sides, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, because they were there hanging out in, the, in a place hiding from the, um, the, the bad guys, so to speak. And he said unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said that, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whoever sins ye remit, they shall be remitted unto them, and whoever sins ye retain shall be retained. And so he sent them out to preach the everlasting gospel. Each writer put in his own thoughts on the process. Now, for three and a half years, the disciples were taught and mentored by Jesus. So he passed on that beach that morning and he called them and they left their nets and they went. They observed his teaching, preaching and healing ministry. And when the time was right, they went out themselves for their own practicum. Remember when he sent them out two by two? And after three and a half years of training with no semester breaks, you would conclude that they had earned enough credits to get a bachelor's degree. We know that Christ came to earth to die for the sins of humanity, but he also came to revive his church. There was always a people throughout history devoted to the truth, and Jesus needed a new church to continue his ministry of calling the world to repentance. Hence his call of these disciples to be the nucleus of this movement. Having now had their bachelor's degree conferred on them, he sends them out into their new district to preach the gospel, and one would think they would be excited. When we accepted Christ as our Redeemer, we accepted the condition of becoming laborers together with God. We made a covenant with him to be holy for the Lord as faithful stewards of the grace of Christ, to labor for the upbuilding of his powers, of mind, soul, and body, to him who has paid the ransom money for our soul. We engage to be soldiers, 
to enter into active service, to endure trials, shame, reproach, to fight the fight of faith, following the captain of our salvation. But sometimes we find it challenging to carry out our mandate. What are some of the things that hamper the execution of the gospel commission? Now, Matthew 28, 18 to 20 tells you what Jesus told them. But look for a minute at Matthew 28, 16 and 17. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So they had a, meet, they, they had a, um, a meeting session. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But read that last line. But somewhat, some doubted. Why were they in doubt? So Jesus says, let us meet at this place at this time. So he sent out a text and they received it. We're going to meet at this place at this time. And they got there. They saw him. They worship him. But some doubted. What does doubt do to the believer? Huh? What, what was it that they were doubting? What was the problem? All right, let me help you. Matthew was a tax collector, and he had to deal with people who hated him. So whenever he was dealing with people, they're vexed because they know he's robbing them. So he had diplomacy. You know, he put it succinctly, some doubt it. Look at, at Mark's version of events. Mark 16 and verse 14. Now you see, the book of Mark, Mark interviewed Peter and wrote his book. So Peter didn't have what Matthew had. So when whatever Peter said, Mark wrote. So Mark 16 and verse 3, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Peter was accustomed to being called out by Jesus. So he didn't pull no punches. He said exactly what happened. That Christ upbraided them. Christ had to say, what is wrong with you? Why are you doubtful? Why is your heart hardened? And it, a lot of that was cultural. They had a certain belief as to what the Messiah would do. And when it didn't follow their plan, their whole ideas and everything was shattered. And so Christ had to shout them out and says. What happened to you? So it was doubt. Is it really Jesus? Who does come back from the dead? What really happened here? He died on the cross or not? Who is this man? Who telling me this man risen? What risen what? The, but, I mean, he had raised Lazarus. He had raised the widow of Nain's son. They saw Jesus raise the dead. But when he himself raised from the dead, they doubted. Hearts hardened. And they, this, how... How does that affect your call to go? Now, this is interesting because after they were upbraided by Jesus, he then says, go. With your doubt, with your hardness of heart, with your unbelief, with all the questions in your heart, he still said, go. He didn't wait for them to fix it, to get it right, to be perfect in spirit, to go. He sent them out. Matthew said, some doubted. But after that, Jesus says, all power is given. Go and pre preach, baptize, and teach. He didn't, he didn't wait to fix the guys. He said, go. And so, where does that leave us? I've been here for all my life, baptized for how much years now? Have to go. The gentlemen have now become members of this battalion. Going, whatever, wherever you are, whatever your sta the stage of your spiritual connection with Christ, even if you're doubting, still go. Preach that gospel. That is where we are. Have you ever questioned the authenticity of the scripture? Do you ever ask yourself if God is real? Did Jesus really die or am I just fooling myself? Is your faith cemented? or as it, Are you planted? What answer did you come up with? 
Does anyone, I mean, have you ever doubted? Has it ever come to you? What, what are we doing here? There really is a God? I mean, if Christ doesn't come before I die, well, I would never know about it. I would just die and be buried and that would be it. And if there's no resurrection, I would never know. You, you, these things don't come to your mind? I mean, it's come to my mind. <laughs> right? So, what would be the antidote for doubt? Second Peter Second Peter chapter 1. Peter himself answered this thing. Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So he's writing this letter, grace be unto you, all of that stuff. And let's go to verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter comes along and gives a list. You have faith. We believe. We ain't doubting anymore. So now that you're getting past this doubt, add this. Virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. Now that we have faith, add some works to it. Get busy in the word of the Lord. Get busy in the work of the Lord. Doing things, right? But he, he didn't stop there. For, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and had forgotten that he was purged of his old sins. You, you can't just say I have faith and I believe. He expects you to put some work, some attitude, some gusto into the thing. And that's the antidote for doubt. You, you would believe it because of the experiences, because of the Holy Spirit, or you would doubt it because of the same reason or, or the hardness of heart. But he's saying that if you're working for the Lord, you're going to dispel your doubts. Don't allow doubt and questions to prevent you from sharing the gospel. While Jesus acknowledged the disciples' questions, he still gave them co the commission to preach the gospel. Questioning your faith doesn't exempt you from your call. Amen. All right? Amen. And, and we, let us hasten on. The lady left. My goodness. So we will, at this point, we will say, we will pray that our faith does not waver. But let's hasten on. Another challenge the disciples had was lack of knowledge. And this is interesting. Luke 24, 25. Luke 24 and verse 25. And he, now, the, what's, the, what's the context to this? These two guys were walking towards Emmaus after the, after the crucifixion, after the ascension. And they're discussing this thing about Jesus of Nazareth. Now, what, they're wondering where we went wrong and what went wrong. And Jesus joins the company of these two men walking. And he's asking them, well, why your heart so sad? And why your countenance falling? And why are you looking so distraught? And they say, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? You know all what happened for the last weekend. And can I pull up verse 24 for me, please? Be kind to me. Thank you. <laughs> and certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it. So as the woman had said, and, but, but him they saw not. You know, and so it's, then comes verse 25. They're confessing that he was, died, he was killed on the cross and buried in the sepulcher. And people went to the grave and saying, he in there, he is risen. And Jesus said to them, oh fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 26. Yeah. Right. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter in his glory? The next verse says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, 
he expounded unto them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. What was the problem here? These fellows did not know the word. Three and a half years with Jesus, but they did not know the word. How could that be? That men who were given full scholarship into Jesus' rabbinical college didn't understand the scripture. Was their curriculum lacking? No. Their main problem was a cultural one. For centuries, the Jews had conceived a mythical theology surrounding the coming of Messiah. This myth had been repeated so often from the pulpit, no less, that it was widely believed. This was the belief that the coming of Messiah would create a Jewish superpower, both politically and military. This had been the motivation for trying to crown him by force after he had fed the multitude. All this misunderstanding could have been avoided by studying the scripture. And so Jesus, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, then had to explain the scripture. He had to give his own students a fresh Bible study. Julius Caesar, commenting on lack of knowledge, says, Without training, they lack knowledge. Without knowledge, they lack confidence. Without confidence, they lack victory. It, it is a serious thing not to have or, or to be without knowledge. I want to say to us tonight, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we should never be destroyed for lack of knowledge. This church has too many authors and too much material to draw help and inspiration from for us to be destroyed for lack of knowledge. Don't use that smartphone just for entertainment. Get access to our publications. Read and research the various topics so that you can adequately answer questions, your own questions and that of others. One question here. Have you been reading the lesson? Have you been reading the Sabbath school lesson? There is no good reason to be ignorant. What does James 1.5 say? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That should never be said of us. There is two, I, I'll, I'll be honest, right? There's a lot of material in Adventist publications. I don't know how much you know, but the, there's a lot of material, and you can find a lot of it online, right? So what do you, if, what do you think we should pray for at this time? What should be our prayer pulse now? We come into the end. Fear not, fear not. What should be our prayer? We should pray now that we would, that the Spirit would stir in us a desire to study the Word, that we would expand our knowledge base, that we would not be left without knowledge. The, um, the, the questions that bombard us from time to time are sophisticated ones, and some are not so sophisticated ones. And we can probably out-argue a person about the scripture, but that might not make them a disciple. We need, inf we need to be able to share the gospel in an intelligent, progressive manner. So we keep a note of that. We pray that the Lord would expand our knowledge base and give us the impetus to study the word. Finally, what the last thing that prevents us from preaching the gospel, life's distractions. John chapter 21, 1 to 3. This is a serious text. And after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise, he showed himself. They were together, Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth, entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. All right? So they had been in seminary for three and a half years with Jesus. They had the wrong mythical concept of what the Messiah's coming would do. There's hopes, and because of that, they, they, their, their whole dreams and everything collapsed at the cross because Jesus was now dead. Whatever political and military empire they expected the Jews to inherit from him was now dashed 
because he was dead. Then come along some people saying he's risen, but they doubted. Their hearts hardened. They ain't sure. And what do they conclude? I go a fishing. Isn't it ironic that just what Jesus had called them from is what they went back to? Jesus had called them from the fishing business, trained them for three and a half years, and now that he was employed, about to employ them in this new ministry, they were going back to fishing. But not by not understanding the mission of Jesus, the disciples opened themselves to disillusionment after his death. With Jesus dead and doubt and unbelief swollen in their minds concerning his resurrection, they could see no clear path forward and were willing to go back. Did you read Ellen White's comments from today's um, lesson study? I found it fascinating. Under the caption, love found a way. After Adam and Eve had sinned, and God told them that they must leave their garden home, from now on toil and suffering would be their lot. Will they have to suffer and finally die with no hope? Is death the end of everything? It was at this point that God gave them the promise recorded in Genesis 3.15. Looking directly at Satan, the serpent, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise, he shall, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Heal. They may not have fully understood at that moment exactly what this meant, but they knew they could hope again. In some way, through the seed of the woman, their redemption, redemption would come. And then, in, that's, and then in Edwin White's notes, how on he who was to suffer death at the hands of evil men was to rise again as a conqueror over sin and the grave. Under the inspiration of the Almighty, the sweet singer of Israel had testified of the glories of the resurrection morning. All of these things Jesus had shared with them. But then when trouble came and the challenges hit them and they were unsure of where they found themselves in this narrative, the brain went back to what it was accustomed to doing and it says, I go in fishing. And the saddest part was the rest of the fellows say, we come in too. Nobody said to Peter, no, we're done with that. We're moving so. Everybody went back, okay? What happened that night? Ain't catch nothing. They caught nothing. And when they got, when the dawn broke, yeah, when the dawn broke, Somebody shout from the shore, Hey, fellas, what y'all got? We ain't got nothing. He said, toss the net on the next side. They tossed the net on the next side, and the same miracle that had hooked them the first time happened again. Christ had to repeat it for their benefit. They caught another huge haul of fish. And one said to the next one, It is the Lord. And they, Peter jumped out and came to the shore. And by the time they got there, Jesus already had fish cooked with bakes made and said, Fellas, let me sit down and eat. Come and dine. Come and dine. They ate this meal that morning. They had their prayer breakfast. And Jesus looks at Peter, John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? When he said to him that, he didn't say, lovest thou me more than these, referring to the disciples around him. He meant, lovest me, thou, you love me more than these fish? Are you willing to leave this fish and come and do what I ask you to do? That is what he was challenging him. The these in the text wasn't the disciples. It was the fish they had, the fish they had toiled all night and didn't catch and that he had provided by the word of his mouth the next morning. It was the expression that I could take care of you. So while you were with me, you were being taken care of. But now you think I'm dead. You're thinking you got to go back to taking care of yourself. No, follow me. I have given you a command. Don't panic. I will take care of you. With one word, he provided more fish again. All right? 
Some persons had to change their careers to be in harmony with God's will when he called them. Had to give up a job. But God is able. For us who grew up in the church, some of us, we pattern our career choices around our faith so that we don't have these pro problems with Sabbath keeping and so on. But others didn't have that luxury. And so when you come to Christ, you have that challenge. Here's what Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 812. The first work that Christ entrusted to Peter on restoring him to ministry was feeding the lambs. This was a work in which Peter had little experience. It would require great care and tenderness, much patience and perseverance. It called him to minister to those who were young in the faith, to teach the ignorant, to open the scriptures to them, and to educate them for the usefulness in Christ's service. Hitherfore, Peter had been had not been fitted to do this or even understand its importance. But this was the work which Christ now called upon him to do. For this work, his own experience of suffering and repentance had prepared him. Before his fall, Peter was always speaking unadvisedly. From the impulse of the moment, he was always ready to correct others and to express his mind before he had a clear comprehension of himself or what he had to say. But the converted Peter was very different. He retained his former fervor, but the grace of Christ regulated his zeal. He was no longer impetuous, self-confident, and self-exalted, but calm, self-possessed, and teachable. He could then feed the lambs as well as the sheep. Amen? Amen. Now that Christ has called us and is challenging us to go into the, into the world and preach this everlasting gospel, what should we pray for now? Because we're going to pray this time. What should we pray for now? What does the Holy Spirit tell you that we should be praying for now? Anyone? In-house, online? What should we pray for now? We want our faith to be expanded. When there is no road, we want to go forward still. We can't see the track. It ain't paved, ain't no blacktop with sidewalk and gutters and clearly defined lanes, but we still want to go forward. We can't see the road, but Christ has said to go. And that is exactly what we want to do. And to to rely on the past experiences of when God came through for us to know that whatever we are going to do in his name, he will, he will assist. So there was doubt, hard-heartedness, lack of knowledge, and life's distractions. But none of those things was important to Jesus. He had said to them to go. Amen. Tonight we review the call to discipleship. Let us stand, let us get together with friends or partners or so, and let us pray about what we've heard tonight. We want to ease, we, we don't want to be in doubt. We want to expand our knowledge base. We want to go forward, not going backwards. And when things get rough, to rely to, to, at our faith will not fail us. Get a prayer partner, please. One person, two persons. Um, our members, join our new members, please. No. Come and join our new brethren. We got to we extend um, the right hand even before the appointed hour. And let us, let us pray together, please. Come. Come close to them, Brother Shari, Brother Green. And let us pray about this. Getting rid of our doubt our hard-heartedness, increasing our knowledge, and not letting life's distraction take over from us. Amen? Amen.
you're gonna We are going to close with the hymn 598, Watch Ye Saints. <clears throat> Let's stand. Watch ye saints with eyelids waking, lo the poor of heaven are shaking. Keep your lamps all trimmed and burning, ready for your Lord's returning. of your Savior, pardon sin and purchase favor, blood wash robes and crowns of glory, yes to tell redemption story, Lord, he comes, Lord Jesus comes, Lord, he comes, he comes all glorious. Jesus come to reign victorious, Lord, he comes, yes, Jesus comes. Kingdoms at the base are crumbling, hark his chariot wheels are rumbling, tell, oh, tell of grace abounding, while the sand Trump is sounding. Lord, he comes. Lord, Jesus comes. Lord, he comes. He comes all glorious. Jesus comes to reign victorious. Lord, he comes. Yes, Jesus comes. Nations win, so proud and stately, Christ is kingdom, his death greatly. Earth all it is pants, his summoning, shouting saints, your Lord is coming. Lord, he comes, Lord Jesus comes. Christ is pleading, now he's interceding, is the grace, time diminish, I'll proclaim the mystery finish, Lord, he comes, Lord, Jesus comes, Lord, he comes, he comes all glorious, Jesus Even so, dear God, as we wait your glorious return, we pray that you would help us through your grace, that we would walk in your precepts, that we will preach the word, that we will honor the call that you've given us so that we would go into all the world and preach this everlasting gospel and help others to be prepared for your soon coming. Take us safely to our, our places of abode. Be our guide and our light. 
and bring us back on Sabbath where we will continue to worship and glorify your name, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good night, everyone. We'll see you again on Sabbath.